Hi. Welcome to another episode of um, the photo department. I am drinking coffee. In my uh, favorite mug again. I am still drinking Maru number two. I'm still drinking it uh, because it's, I don't want to go bad. <laughs> Uh, and I want to finish it before I finish another, or start another um, bag of coffee. This is already, let's see, nine, nine. So coffee, coffee's at its peak about seven days after it's roasted, and we call that off roast. So a coffee is at its optimum peak, best freshness, best taste, everything about seven days after it's been roasted and then it steadily declines from there. Depending on how you store your coffee, uh, you can drink it two, three, four months out with no noticeable degradation in quality. I store my coffee in the original bags in a cool, dry place. So um, this coffee was roasted on September 9th. Uh, it is currently it's October 4th. So it's almost uh, an entire month off roast, but it still tastes really good. And um, I don't notice any degradation in the, in the flavor profile or anything. Mm. I also don't grind it until I'm about to use it. And that's a big um, thing that'll help keep your coffee really fresh. Don't grind your coffee until you're about to brew it and it'll last a lot longer and taste better too. With all that being said, do what you want because it's your coffee, it's your preferences. Drink as old or as new of coffee that you want. Nothing matters. Some things matter, just not all that much. If you hear kind of like a low hum or whooshing sound, that's my air purifier right here. It's right in front of the camera actually. Uh, it's still kind of air quality is, is a little iffy in California, um, especially in the Bay Area where I'm at currently. So um, taking precautions, making sure that uh, not breathing in smoke. Today is a fun one. I really have been putting off doing more stuff like this for a while just because I haven't had time or I've been busy with other stuff or I've been depressed, <laughs> whatever. There's all sorts of reasons and excuses not to do cool things, but I'm not, no more. I will no longer be making excuses for doing cool things. I'm doing cool things today. Uh, my good friend and fellow photographer, Isabel De La Cruz, is a San Francisco-based photographer who uh, does weddings, elopements, um, all sorts of cool stuff. Her work is crazy, amazing. Her and her husband are both photographers. They do astrophotography as well, which is really, really cool. Uh, and they're big on film as well. They are beautiful people who are really wonderful and they uh, always have a whole bunch of film, but um, recently Isabel was going through her refrigerator and realized that she had way too much film and wanted to get rid of some of it. And so she offered to gift me some film. And so she sent me like a big uh, plastic bag filled with some film she thought I would think was really cool. And uh, this, this is one of the rolls of film that was in that bag. You can see there's no writing or anything around it. I have no idea what this is. She didn't know what this was when I asked her about it. Um, so I thought it would be kind of a cool idea to open this roll, find out what it is with you guys, and then go out, uh, shoot it and develop it, and then, you know, have some fun. I don't know what this is. It's almost certainly expired. My idea today was to, you know, no matter how expired it is, shoot, this expired film at box speed and kind of see what the results are. I've seen some projects with people shooting expired film at box speed with really cool results. Obviously it's gonna look underexposed, but sometimes that looks really rad uh, depending on your subject and what you're doing. So let's open this together and find out what this is. First time, I have no idea what this is. Uh oh, it's black. That doesn't bode well because there's no mark. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I've opened it and there's no, there are no markings. There are no markings whatsoever on the roll. So that's funny. Uh, I don't, so I don't know what this is for sure. For sure I have no idea what film this is. It's gonna be difficult because how am I supposed to shoot it? 
what do I shoot this at? So my original thought was to shoot um, in the Mamiya RB67 because she hasn't been getting a lot of love lately. I've been shooting my Roliflex a lot more, um, but I think today's a Mamiya RB67 day. So that's what we're gonna put it in. So I'm going to load the film into the back and maybe in the process of loading it and kind of unspooling it, I'll figure out what kind of film this is. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of a fun experiment. Like, you know, I usually go into shooting film um, with all my variables kind of known. Uh, so if anything goes really wrong, it's all on me. But uh, this is, this is a new, this is new territory. So let's get this tape off. Okay. Okay, so, so far it just says film. It says 120 film and then start. So that's, that's all the clue that we got. So far, this might be black. Is this black and white film? I'm not sure. So you can see here, these start arrows, those are different. I haven't seen start arrows like that before, right? That's kind of different. Um, black backing. So, so maybe some of you already know what this film is because you recognize the backing and uh, the start arrows or whatever, but I don't, I don't know what this is. All right. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but we're ready to go. So I'm going to go out and shoot this roll around town, uh, do some street stuff. I'm guessing it's black. I guess it's black and white. We're going to find out. So I'll be back, I guess. Wish me luck. because I wasn't recording video. It's been a crazy week. It's been wild. Um, I, report, I recorded the first half of this video, uh, I think last week. And a lot of stuff has happened since then. Um, some of you might know already, I'm moving to Los Angeles. It's gonna be an interesting move. It's not super far from where I live now. I live about five and a half hours away in Oakland. Yeah, five and a half hours is, is a far drive. That's like a 45 minute plane ride. It's not that far. My sister moved to San Diego after she had her first 
daughter, my niece, and then she has another daughter on the way in December. And I just want to be close to my sister and her fiance and my nieces uh, and be around during their formative years. I thought that was really important. And so I'm making the jump to Los Angeles. Um, other than that, business has dried up here. There's not a lot of work here for photographers and filmmakers. Um, being, it, it's become really hard to live here, difficult to afford living here. Um, you know, I grew up here, lived here all my life. I was born here uh, over 12 years in Oakland and I love Oakland. I love this area. I love everything about the Bay Area, but right now it feels like a really good time to move somewhere else, try something else for a little while. And Los Angeles is just bursting at the seams with creators. And a lot of my friends are down there. Uh, Christine, who, uh, you know, is, as you know, is another YouTube creator I'm really good friends with. She's down there. We're going to collaborate on a bunch of stuff too. I've already got plans with her. Um, as soon as I get down there, I'll be moved in to my new place by Halloween. So I'm very excited for that. And there's going to be a lot more content. I'm going to be living right next to uh, Samuel Elkins, who you guys know. So big things are happening, which is why my room is a complete catastrophe. My desk is a terrible mess. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to be filming in front of it, but I wanted to film something today and I didn't want to clean. So here we are. You'll also notice got this microphone in front of my face today. I seemed to have murdered my Movo lavalier mic and it won't pass a signal to anything. And you know, it's been a good two years. RIP little buddy. It's time to invest in something a little more robust. I think might go with those road mic goes or whatever, those little tiny things. Um, those look like they're pretty cool. Not important. Who cares? So yeah, I've got a, I've got a dynamic mic on this boom arm plugged into a USB interface going into my iMac recording audio on a uh, garage band, as you can see behind me, which I meant to minimize. That's better. I also don't have a pop filter for this microphone. So if the audio is a little bit wonky, cause you hear me with the P's and the S's are, are a little bit much, there's popping and stuff. I'm really sorry. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> this was a last minute thing. I don't know why I don't have a pop filter, but I don't. I think this is time to get one, but I won't use it that often. See, I don't know if I should buy it. Am I going to use it? I don't even know. I'd use it right now. <sighs> you know, I used to have a pop filter. Where did that go? Today I'm drinking Oakland coffee which seemed appropriate as we are in Oakland. This is the Atomic Garden blend, which is kind of their everyday blend of coffee. It's a little bit darker roasted. It's more of like a diner style coffee. Uh, I dig it. Uh, I iced it down and this is a cold iced coffee version of it. And um, it's pretty refreshing. I like it. My buddy and drummer of my band, Ross, uh, works there and he hooked it up. And I got this cool travel mug, which is really big that I really like. Definitely going to be repping this in LA. Apparently the owners of the roastery or at least investors in the roastery are members of Green Day. Apparently all of those guys um, invest in that in Oakland coffee or own part of it, something like that, um, which is cool. Those guys are all from this area and they're all very active in the Oakland and Berkeley communities which is very cool. This is a roll of Portra 400 shot with my Rolleiflex. Um, I cut it into frames of three uh, to fit into this archival sleeve page thing, uh, which will keep it protected when I store it and also make it easy for me to find specific frames when I want to scan uh, photos again, um, which is really handy. And I've been using these for a long time to store all my film. Uh, and they do great. They're really great for keeping film protected. Uh, and it's a very, very handy way to store your film. Uh, and relatively inexpensive. Depends on how much film you shoot. I shoot a lot, so I spend quite a bit on these. But uh, this is how they normally look. This is the mystery film. 
As you can see, it's heavily curled upon itself. Uh, this sucks. So last week when I went to shoot this film, I didn't know what it was. And then I developed it and did a little research and I found out that this is Shanghai 100 black and white film, which I'd never heard of before. Uh, I did some research on the film and read some reviews and um, a lot of the reviews talk about how this film sucks and you shouldn't shoot it and it's terrible. And I thought to myself, hey, that can't be right. Like there's got to be something that this film is good for. Like it's not all film is cool. All film has a purpose. I mean, there are some kooky ones out there like that, uh, Lomography, uh, purple, um, which is something I probably would never use, but, um, I can see really cool applications for it. And, uh, I like experimenting, especially with film that I have never shot before. So I thought, yeah, it's just people online being people online. They're just like complaining for no reason. This is the rare case where online reviews are dead on this film sucks. I don't say this lightly because I love, love, love film. I love all different kinds of film, but um, there are several different reasons why this film is terrible and why I probably will never shoot it again. The first reason is look how much it curls. And the reason for that is that the film substrate, the actual plastic backing that the emulsion is, um, is on uh, is really, really, really thin. Um, and you'll see that in films like um, Japan Camera Hunters, uh, street pan 400 uh that's an old surveillance style film and um i think those were stored in really long rolls in order to like film for long periods of time so that substrate had to kind of be thin to save space but it's not even as thin as this that's kind of annoying to develop and handle as well but this is way worse um the only reason i would see that they would be using such a thin substrate on this film is probably because they wanted to save money and um man did it really have an impact on the usability of this film it's just so thin it won't it, it curls up like a tight little ahoy <laughs> <laughs> i had this roll hanging from my closet uh on hooks and then it was weighted down with another um a clamp on the bottom in order to kind of straighten it out as it was drying and that had zero effect on how curly this film is, which is unfortunate. It was really hard to get it into this uh, archival sleeve and it was even harder to try to scan. Luckily, I scan using the Lomography Digitalizer um, film carriers, which, which use magnets to secure the film in place. So it does a much better job with curly film, but even then it can only do so much because this film is like, it's so tightly wound. <laughs> It's kind of ridiculous. That's number one. Number two, the film backing on the 120 film has markings to show you where the frames are if you have a camera that, say, has a little viewing window, like some old TLRs will have a little viewing window in the back where it'll show on the backing paper, you're on frame four or vice versa, whatever. You'll see, you can see on this film, there's like circles and uh, numbers and other markings imprinted on the frames, uh, which means that the backing paper was actually imprinting the print of the markings onto the film itself, which sucks because it's, you know, the film's already really grainy and kind of flat, but now you've got these like imprinted imperfections on it. So it's already kind of unintelligible. And then it has another layer of crap on it from the film back. And, you know, I would say that the quality of prints that you're going to get or the quality of negative you're going to get is, you know, it's okay. It, the density is okay, but it's just not very sharp. The grain is big and blocky and it's really flat. So you've already got that going with it. The only editing that I did on these frames, by the way, is adding contrast because there was practically none. But then you have the backing paper markings like imprinting on your film. That looks bad. So I can't see a reason why you'd want to use this film for any projects because sometimes films have like quirky attributes that can, you know, add to uh, the feel or stylistic, you know, direction of a project. 
I can't really think of a project I would want to have this kind of quirkiness attributed to it. Maybe somebody out there does. Um, if you want to try this film for something weird, maybe go ahead. Um, just know that, like I said, with the curly nature of the film, there's no getting this straight. It's going to be a pain in the butt to try to scan. I also... <clears throat> I'm a little bummed the way it came out. I was hoping it wasn't going to be totally garbage because some of the frames that I got were really cool. I took um, a bunch of photos of my local post office branch for a series that I'm doing on the USPS because as we know, that's under attack by this current stupid administration. And I thought some of the frames that I got were pretty cool. And just the weird crap that this film does to your frames, it just makes it unusable, which is like, you know, a bummer for me. I don't, I don't think this will be um, good for the project. Cause I think that the things that it kind of the quirkiness that it imparts on your film is distracting. It's not adding anything. So I'm not going to use these for my project. Unfortunately, would I use this film personally? I would not. Would I recommend this film? I don't know. I don't think so. Unless you are going to have it developed and scanned by a lab and you don't care about how sharp or good or clean your images are, yeah, maybe try it out. But again, it's I've tried crappy black and white film before and gotten good results. And like I said, the weird quirkiness attributed to that film worked out for you know what I was shooting, but this doesn't do anything for me. So... Not for me, but maybe for you. I don't know. So that so that concludes my first mystery film installment. Do you want to see more mystery film episodes? If you do, let me know in the comments. This was really fun. I really enjoyed going out and shooting a film that I didn't know what it was and then seeing the results. Even if the, though they weren't good and I wasn't happy with them, it was still a cool experience. Uh, and it was fun having to think on my feet and decide, you know, in the beginning what ISO I was going to shoot it at, not knowing the film at all. So I enjoyed it. If you out there, uh -huh, if one of you out there has some film, some weird old film or weird new film that is ambiguous and you want me to shoot it and make an episode, I would love to do that. Um, so if you want to send me film leave me a comment or DM me on Instagram and I will get back to you. That sounds like a fun idea. Uh, and also let me know what kind of weird film you're into shooting or if you've ever shot a role of mystery film that came out really cool. I would love to hear about and see that, leave that stuff in the comments. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate you guys tuning in and sharing my videos and uh, watching them every week. It really helps to have you guys out there supporting this channel. Uh, means a lot to me. If you want to help me with my moving fund, or if you want to contribute to my moving fund uh, to help alleviate some of the expenses that come with, you know, moving, you can go to my Teespring. It's in the description and you can buy photo department merch. There's a bunch of cool stuff. There's t-shirts and hoodies. It is hoodie season, even though it's hot as hell right now. It's super hot today, but it will be soon. So get those hoodies while you can. I'm also doing a print sale that's going on from now until the middle of October. So if you go to seastermphoto.com forward slash shop, you can pick out a print or my coffee and food book or whatever. And it's 15% off automatically taken off when you check out. And that will really help me with moving expenses and you will get a beautiful print for your home, which is always fun. Uh, and those get um, printed and shipped as you order them. So they're fresh off the printer, which is really cool. Make sure you check out my previous episode with Asel Tai. Uh, it's the series Social Study, which I'm kind of starting up again, which is where I sit down and talk with artists and uh, content creators and um, all sorts of interesting people that I think... Uh, are really interesting and doing really cool things. And I think that um, it's a really fun little experiment that I've been doing. I love talking to people and talking about their, uh, their favorite things to do, what inspires them, why they do what they do. And I think that you guys will really benefit from watching those conversations. I have another one coming out pretty soon, which uh, is a photographer friend of mine, which is going to be really cool. I'm really excited about that one. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Mm, wash your hands. Stay safe. Wear a damn mask.
vote, 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 vote. And in case you were thinking about not voting, you should vote. Okay. Yeah. Thank you guys again. See you guys next time.